Amen. All right. Uh, I wanted to give you some encouragement and some instruction as we get ready to close out 2022 and get ready for 2023. And in doing so, I just want to pick one of my favorite passages of Scripture and let's just run through it, okay? I'm not going to be able to dig out from it all the great nuggets of truth. And in all seriousness, just preaching this one chapter, if we really tried to um, uh, do it justice, it would take us two or three months uh, just to do it. But we're just going to hit the high spots, the mountain peaks, and uh, draw from it that which uh, I think God would have us to see tonight in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is one of the high points of the entire Word of God. Uh, there's no more profound, deep uh, theology, no more uh, encouragement uh, that, that you can find in the Word of God other than Romans chapter 8. Um, a lot of people tend to miss, though, the primary theme of Romans 8. Romans 8 is all about the Holy Spirit. It's the greatest chapter in the entire Word of God on the Holy Spirit. It's about life in the Holy Spirit. In our study of Ephesians 1, when we've been looking at the prayer of Paul in Ephesians 1, we've noticed that the, the one main prayer request that Paul makes is that uh, God would open our eyes to understand, that our, the eyes of our heart and our mind would be enlightened, to understand all that we have in Christ and to understand the inheritance that is ours uh, because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you're going to see some of that in Romans chapter 8 as well. Um, so uh, let's begin uh, in verse 1. He starts out by there is therefore. There is now therefore. Now anytime you see the word therefore in Scripture, you've got to go back and see what it's there for. He's referring back to what he says in chapter 7. Chapter 7 in Romans is one of the darkest chapters in the Bible. Yeah, Paul is being honest and open. He is sharing his heart. He's sharing his life, and he's sharing his own struggle. Um, uh, in chapters 1 through uh, 5, he tells us all about the greatness of the glory of the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, why we need it, what it is, and what its results are, starting in chapter 6. Uh, the difference that salvation brings to someone who has actually received the salvation of Jesus Christ by grace through faith. And the, the transformation in our hearts and lives, that we no longer are bound by sin uh, and bondage to sin, that we live differently, we live in righteousness, and we, we, and we walk in holiness. And then in chapter 7, he says, yeah, I know all that, and I know what I'm supposed to do, I just don't do it. And he says, the things I know I don't do, I end up doing it, and it makes me miserable. And then he cries out in verse 24 of chapter 7, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Um, as he says, like I'm carrying a dead body around on my back all the time, this corruption, um, that my spirit, is what he's telling us, my spirit's been redeemed. My spirit has been changed. I'm a new man. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Everything spiritual I am has been made different, but I'm still living in this body of human flesh that's under the curse of sin. And since I'm living in this body, I am prone to certain temptations. And he said, I'm still struggling with what this flesh sometimes causes me to do because remember, our, our flesh is our hormones. It has our, our things that, that lead to emotions. It, it ha is our brain, the way we think about things. And he says, we're still living in, in this. And so he says, I still struggle. Uh, but he says, I thank the Lord through Jesus Christ, our, our Lord. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In other words, he says, the only, the only hope I have to be able to deal with this is, is Christ. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God. With the flesh, the law of sin. He says, I'm trying my best to do that which I know God wants me to do. But he says, I know sometimes I'm still going to find myself yielding the, the temptation. But he says, the good news is this. Because if you're like me, the closer you draw to Christ and the more you grow in your knowledge and understanding of Him, the more horrible you're going to feel about the sin in your life. I mean, it's going to really bother you. You used to be able to do stuff and no big deal. But as God really works in your life and you're, you're growing in Him, when, when unrighteousness is present, when sin is present, it really bugs you. It hurts. It, and, and my harshest critic is me, you know?
because I understand what Christ has done for me. I, I do. He's given me that understanding through his word. And then when I don't live up to what I know he expects of me and wants of me, it hurts. All right? So Paul says, he gives himself a pep talk. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, if he's not going to condemn me, if Christ isn't going to condemn me, why are you going to try to turn around and condemn yourself? Who do you think you are? Is your standard of holiness higher than God's? You know, I've heard people all the time, you know, I know God's forgiven me, I just can't forgive myself. Well, don't you think pretty highly of yourself? Your standard of righteousness and holiness is higher than his. He's forgiven you, and you're saying you can't forgive yourself. That's some standard you got, all right? Uh, there's no condemnation to those who are, and there's his phrase, in Christ. There's no condemnation because we're in him. It's not, it's, there's no condemnation not because we are good. It's because of who he is. That we're clothed in his righteousness. We've been given, imputed his righteousness. But I want you to notice, now, we often leave it there. We like that good night. There's no condemnation. Of those, amen? No condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. So don't feel bad about things. But then he tells us, how do you know who are those that are in Christ Jesus? How do you know you're in Christ Jesus? That's what he goes on to say. Who do not walk, that's the way you live in the daily course of your life, according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There's no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus because if you're in Christ Jesus, you're going to be walking in the normal daily habit of your life in the Spirit and not according to the flesh. That is going to be the pattern. You might get yourself into some sin, but you're not going to stay there. You're not going to continue. God's going to deal with it. The Word's going to deal with it. Now, when it says those who are to walk according to the Spirit, remember, to be filled with the Spirit means to be filled with the Word. Okay, To be filled with the Spirit means to be filled with the Word. So he says, there's no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus, to those who are walking according to the Word. The Spirit's the one who inspired the Word. The Spirit's the one who gives understanding of the Word. And the Spirit is the one who empowers you and enables you to walk in obedience to it. So he says, to those who walk according to the uh, uh, in the spirit, not according to the flesh. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. Okay? Sin doesn't have that power over us anymore, so we don't have to walk in it. For what the law could not do, in other words, the law can't make you holy. It can just point out this is what holiness looks like, and you aren't living it. For what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemns sin in the flesh. Our victory over sin is not necessarily our victory over sin, it's Christ's victory over sin. And we only have victory over sin because we are in him who won the victory in sin. Give credit where credit is due. It's all because of Christ that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Notice verse 4, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That is, remember our study of 1 John, the overview of 1 John I just did a few weeks ago? How do you know that you're saved? Well, how do you tell the genuine from the counterfeit? Paul's saying the same thing here. The genuine is the one who walks according to the Spirit, to the Word, and not according to the flesh. The person that can continue to keep habitually living in the same old sin and it not really bother them, they have no desire to change, they can just stay and wallow in it, they're lost. They're just lost. You say, but Brother Tim, I saw them when they were 12 years old and they were in Bible school and they got saved and they got baptized and this, that, and the other stuff. Now, now in their 20s, they got away from God and they're living out here and they're doing this, that, and the other stuff. But I just thank the Lord I know they got saved when they were 12. Really? You know they got saved when they were 12 at Bible school? You saw what the Holy Spirit was doing in their heart in that moment? You know they were born again in the Spirit of God? You know God's grace reached down and did that? How do you know that was a genuine thing back there where they really got saved? Here's how you know. How do they live after that? 
I'm going to say something that's going to shock you. How can you tell? When do you know that someone's really saved? Not until they die. You don't really know until they die. You say, my semen, you don't know until they die. You know why? The Bible says over and over and over again, one of these days I'm going to do a sermon on it, it's going to blow your mind. The Bible says over and over and over, it's the one who perseveres to the end. That one is the one who's saved. If you drop out before, you're not. It's not that you lost your salvation. That just demonstrates you never were. It's only the one who perseveres to the end. Those that keep taking these detours and go other places and do that and the other stuff, that's evidence. No, 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 no. I don't care what they say. I don't care what church they're a membership of. I don't care how many times they were baptized. It's the one who perseveres, stays by the stuff to the end. That's the one who's saved. Do I have assurance that I'm saved now? Yes, I do. We're going to read that verse in just a moment. How do you know that I'm saved? You're not going to know it until you come to my funeral. Because if Tim takes a detour and I spend a few years out there in the world just doing my own thing, you know what that says? Tim's, it's not that Tim's back to them, Tim's lost. I'll wait till I preach that one. All right. If you, if you don't have issues with me now, you probably will then. All right. You can. And, and we'll see evidences of those in Scripture. But the thing is, when, when there are people that get backslidden, God deals with them. He, he just doesn't let them continue. He just doesn't. He, he, he deals with them. And uh, he will either do it through his spirit, he will do it through whatever circumstances are necessary, or he'll put Christians in their path and get them straight. And then there's also the, the, one of the other areas where that's supposed to happen is in the area of church discipline. We're supposed to hold each other accountable for the lives that we lead. And the church bears certain responsibility to do what the Bible says we need to do to uh, get people back where they need to be. And, and when the church does that, you know, and, and they don't respond, he says, just turn them out, you know. Um, I've done that, actually, in churches. And hopefully I won't have to do it more, but I have done that, all right. I mean, it's Scripture, folks. If God's Word says you got to do it, you got to do it, <laughs> whether you want to or not. It's God's Word, all right. Uh, for those who live according to the flesh, now notice verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit... Now he says, how, how are you going to walk according to the Spirit? How are you going to live according to the Spirit? They, set, they, they live according to the Spirit. They set their mind on the things of the Spirit. How you live is a result of how you think and what you put in your mind. I mean, seriously, the thing that uh, just never ceases to amaze me is how many times I see Christians, professing Christians, filling their minds with the garbage of the world over and over and over again. I mean, we, we saturate our minds with the things of the world. I took Courtney to work yesterday at Walmart. No exaggeration. I drop her off, I pull into the Walmart parking lot, I drop her off at the first door, and then I drive down past the second door, come back around, get, go to the light, and come back up, all right? Between the door where I dropped her off, approaching the door to where I dropped her off, and the second door, I almost ran over three people. I did yesterday. I almost ran over three people because they were on their phone, crossing the road, all right? I mean, can't even put their phone down long enough to get across the road to go into Walmart how, what could be so important? But yet, we feel, Christmas, we were with family. We're in the same house. We haven't seen some of each other. We have some family members that were from out of town that came down to, to be with us on Christmas Day. You haven't seen them in uh, a year or so, and there they are, and they're right in front of us, and we're talking. And guess what people are doing? Instead of talking to one another, texting. And somebody downstairs was texting somebody on the, the, the second floor. I mean, seriously. <laughs> I mean, 
And now with the streaming services, I saw a report on the news today about so many millions of people that are on Netflix and Hulu and this, that, and the other stuff. Folks, there's not a whole lot of good stuff on Netflix and Hulu. There's not. I mean, you can find some stuff, but it's, you got to really hunt for it. And we just fill our minds continually. And if we're, we're not getting on the R-rated movies, the, the news. If you want to make yourself miserable and you want to get angry and upset and you want to start not liking people, sit down and watch Fox News for about six hours. Seriously. And if you're not going to get upset by that crew, turn over to CNN. They'll make you really irate. <laughs> All right? I mean, seriously. I, it's just unreal. What do we choose to think about? What do we choose to fill our mind with? The Word of God says, if you're filling yourself with the stuff of the flesh, you're going to live according to the flesh. But the secret to walking in the Spirit and living by the Spirit is filling your mind with the things. That's why Paul says in Romans 12, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Why? How? Through the renewing of the mind. You've got to learn to think differently. You've got to put new stuff in there. Okay? And I say all that to get to this, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. All right. Carnal Christian. Carnal Christian. You've heard the term? Okay. Carnal Christian primarily goes back to the 1970s. A guy named uh, Bill Bright, who was the head of the Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, was teaching and trying to disciple Christians, and he designed these circles, um, to help us understand the basic Christian life. And the Christian life kind of, or the life goes like this. That's your heart. Each of those circles represents a heart. The chair is the throne. Okay? You have something ruling and reigning over your heart and over your life. Now, the let's see which of these works. The lost person. Self is on the throne. Christ is outside the life. Okay? That's a person who's lost. Self on the throne, you live by self, do what you want, you're in control, you're in charge, Christ is outside your life. Let me go ahead and do this one. All right. So this is the model. We were all taught this model. Hopefully, you were probably taught this model somewhere in your life. I was taught it many times. I taught it at some points in time in my life. So this is the lost person. Self is on the throne of the heart. Christ is on the outside. This is a person who has been saved, and Christ is in their life, but self is still reigning and ruling. And this is referred to as a carnal Christian. Okay? A carnal Christian. Paul refers to the carnal Christian, or refers to carnal, right here in Romans 8. Then you have the spirit-filled Christian, which Christ is reigning and ruling on the throne of the heart, and self is now outside. Self has been put to death. Christ is reigning and ruling. This is the spirit-filled Christian. So you have the lost person, you have the spirit-filled person, 
and you have a carnal Christian, someone who is saved, but they are not living for the Lord. They're, they're still doing their own thing. Okay? And so that would be, now let me read it again. It says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the mind, carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. All right. So this is what all teenagers were taught in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 2000s. Okay. If you went to any Christian camp, if you did any of that kind of stuff, if you attended a college Bible study, this is what you were taught. Most churches, this is what they taught. And so they, the, the, and the gist of it is learning how to overcome being a carnal Christian so that you can become a spirit-filled Christian. There is only one problem with this. It's a lie. There's no truth in this. Because according to the Bible, there is no such thing as a carnal Christian. A carnal Christian doesn't exist. Read again the passage. For to be carnally minded, fleshly minded. Now he just talked about if you fill your mind with the things of the flesh, you're going to walk according to the flesh. If you fill your mind with the things of the spirit, you're going to walk according to the spirit. For to be carnally minded, that means you've been filling your mind, your life with the things of the flesh, is what? Death. Death. Now, in Scripture, there's one, only one interpretation of death anywhere. Cut off from God under the wrath and judgment of God. That is death. In the day that you eat of the fruit of this tree, you shall surely die. The wages of sin is death. That's lostness. But to be spiritually minded, you're only spiritually minded, if you, he's going to tell us if you got the Spirit, is what? Life. Spiritually minded is saved, life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity. You're the enemy of God. First John says, when we were lost, we were the enemies of God. You can't be saved in the enemy of God. It's impossible to be saved and be the enemy of God. So it's the carnal person is not a Christian who's living a fleshly life, a carnal person is lost. Lost. There is no such thing as a carnal Christian. You can have a person professing to be a Christian that's as lost as a goose in a snowstorm, whatever lost that is, but, but they're not a Christian. And they're not someone who one time was saved and lost it. They're just lost. Everything in the passage reinforces that. And it says, because the spiritual, uh, the carnal mind is enmity against God, and they're in death, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. In other words, he's saying the carnal mind can't walk in obedience to God or his law. Is that the position of a Christian? No, we've been set free from bondage to sin so that we now can walk in obedience. So then those who are in the flesh, what? Cannot please God. That's a lot. Why? Because they're lost. But then he says, as a contrast, but you are not in the flesh. You are not carnal, but you're in the spirit. And he said, you're safe, folks. How do you know? If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. The, 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 the inference here is the carnal person doesn't have the spirit of God living in them. If the spirit of God is not living in them, they are lost. Because he goes on to say, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Well, that's pretty clear. So as sharp as Bill Bright was, who led the whole organization and all that kind of stuff, he's just wrong. <laughs> just wrong. Okay? That is not what the Word of God says. One of the things, I think, why they came up with this creature kind of let people that were not living the way they need to be living off the hook. 
to say, yeah, you can still be saved, just keep, but still keep living the same old life. And that you just need to remind yourself there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, no. <laughs> there are no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, those who are walking in the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Okay? Um, again, people really get upset when I teach this, but I'm just I'm telling it's just the word of God, and that is these people that at one time were in church and this, that, and the other stuff, doing whatever they were doing, and now they're just out there in the world. And we say, we just need to get them back in church, and they need to be get rededicated, get revived. No, they need to get saved. Get saved. Because their life is demonstrating their lost. Do I still struggle with sin? Yes. Yes. Daily. But the overwhelming desire of my heart is to walk in obedience. I really desire obedience. I want to be the man God saved me to be. And when I don't, he deals with me. The Holy Spirit in my inward conscience, it bothers me, it hurts me. And then he brings my mama and my wife into the picture. Before I got married, Mama Cook, she always knew any time I was doing something I shouldn't do. I was a senior in high school, at Goose Creek High School. I did not study for my... Spanish class that day, and so I decided I was going to cut class. And so I drove to school, and so I just, instead of going to class, I just went out and sat in the parking lot. Now, Goose Creek High School was not necessarily close to where Mama Cook's house was, okay? And so I'm sitting there in my car, and all of a sudden, I hear this tap on the window. Guess who decided to come drive through the parking lot at school at that particular time? My mom. And she's, I rolled down and she said, what are you doing here? And I said, what are you doing here? And she says, something just told me I need to come check on you. <laughs> There's a long list of times that I could tell you that were just like that. I don't know how God gives moms this, this spiritual intuition when it comes to their kids because they're really connected to them. But you don't even have to just, you don't have to do it. You just think it. <laughs> and then, Robin? Guys, I, I don't know how to say this, but I'm not coming across it's not going to come across good no matter what, but I'm a reasonably intelligent guy. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I will convince myself I can do something I shouldn't do and get away with it. I never have. Not once. I could tell you, I'm not going to embarrass myself by telling you, but... I tell you story after story after story of somehow, some way, Robin found out, Robin knew in the strangest ways, but she always does. And again, it's not just what I do. She knows if I'm even thinking about doing something. She knows. How? Because the two are one. My spirit and her spirit are joined. And when there's something going on in my spirit, she knows. That's a biblical principle. And you know what? That's a good thing. God loves me enough to put people in my life to keep me straight. Because he knows me. And he knows from time to time I'll be prone to wonder. Find myself in sin. And he loves me so much he gives me a mama and gives me a, a wife that knows me better than I know me because he knows me better than all of them do, and keeps me straight. And if I ignore their godly wisdom and counsel and just go ahead and jump right in, he loves me enough that when necessary, he's taking me to the woodshed because he knew the thing I was doing was going to hurt me, and it was going to hurt my family, and it was going to hurt my reputation, and it was going to hurt the people that looked up to me, and it was going to discourage them. And so he deals with it. He does that because he loves me. 
And he does it because his greatest goal is to bring glory to himself through how he deals with me in my life. Well, that's the gist of Romans 8 and a great portion of it. But let's end on this real positive note. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. Our weaknesses are not just our sicknesses and all. It's, it's in our sin. He helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be. Part of our inheritance in Christ and what we have in Christ by being in Christ is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things the Holy Spirit does for us is he intercedes for us. Skip down verse 29. Well, verse 28. For we know that all things work together for good. What's the good? To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Always remember, it's God's work. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, not ours. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Here's the good, and here's the purpose. To be conformed to the image of his Son. To make us like Jesus that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Those he justified, these he will also glorify. It's a done deal, folks, from beginning to end. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He will bring it to pass. Be encouraged. <laughs> he saves us in spite of us. He works his will in our lives in spite of us. And he does what's necessary to shape our will to become like his. That's awesome. Because when my will is like his, we are in perfect union and harmony and oneness. And then my life is glorifying him and putting him on display. What shall we say then? Say to all these things, what things? All, all the things. Why shall we say to all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him also freely give us all things? He's going to take care of us. He's going to give us whatever we need to accomplish his plan and purpose and will for our lives so that our lives glorify him. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. He's all the time making accusations against us. The only time Satan tells the truth is when he's talking about us. Because when he makes accusations against us, it's usually true. But guess what? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. I've had people, <laughs> you probably have too, I've had people accuse me of all kinds of stuff in my life that wasn't true. All kinds of stuff. Because they, they love to just try to tear you apart. Sometimes the people just sometimes the people just love tearing you apart, and they'll accuse you of whatever just to make you try to look bad, whether you did it or not. Who brings any charge? Yes, God who justifies. He knows the truth. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died. Furthermore, is also risen. Who's even at the right hand of God? Who is making intercession? He's our advocate, pleading our case. No matter what Satan the demons, or any human being says, says about you, Jesus is standing there presenting the truth that we belong to him and that he's justified us with his own blood. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we're killed all the day long, we're counted sheep for the slaughter. We're, we consider ourselves dead already because we're crucified with Christ. And if Christ calls us to die for him, we die. Yet in all these things, all those things he just said, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. One last thing about the trip to Israel. Robin and I stood on the ground where Christians died. Devoured by lions. We walked in the places where they had they kept the lions in the theater. The very spot where they shed their blood for faithfulness to Christ. 
they told us that when the Christian families were brought out in the middle of the, the arena, the parents who had children would throw their children to the lions first. And say, wow, that's not fair. They would, they would, they would throw their children to the lions first. Why? It was merciful. Lions, see, they were really hungry. They kept them, kept them hungry. And then they released them. When a lion is really hungry, it will devour its prey in an instant. It will just devour the prey. Once the lion is full, it will play with its food. It will taunt it. It will paw it. It will tear at it. It will gnaw at it in pieces. So the parents would throw their children to the lions, giving them a merciful, quick death where they didn't have to suffer but a second or two, knowing that it would mean they themselves would endure much worse. Folks, when you stand on the ground where your brothers and sisters in Christ we're called to stand there and say, all you've got to do is say, Caesar as curios. Caesar is Lord. And we'll let you go home. And when they were told, all you have to say, Caesar as curios, they would raise their voice and say, Jesus as curios. Jesus is Lord. And then they released the lions on them. When you see their faith and their commitment, even unto death, and stand on the ground where they died, it causes you to look at yourself and your own level of commitment and the excuses we make for not being faithful. And then cry out as Paul, oh, wretched man that I am. Paul says here, and this is important, because the day's coming when even we here, our Christianity is going to cost us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, that's demonic spirits, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And where are we? In Christ. In Him. It's that truth that sees you through the tough times. When your life and your heart is in broken, tattered pieces, remind yourself of this truth. We don't know what 2023 is going to bring. Have no clue. We saw just a couple of years ago how quickly life can change from just a little virus. And the whole world, our whole lives are turned upside down. A doctor's diagnosis, an accident. There's so many things in this world that can change everything except one thing. No matter what else changes, he never changes. And his steadfast love and loving kindness toward us never changes. And his grace is always sufficient. So, no matter what this year brings, Remember who we are in Christ. And remember the joy that is ours because we're in Him. All right? Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. And we thank you for how we have seen it demonstrated time and time and time again. And my prayer for the folks in this room could be right tonight have heavy hearts for one reason or the other, 
may you make your love more real, more present, more tangible to them at this time than ever before in their life. May they see the word of God lived out in them and through them. In Jesus' name.